I want you to turn with me to Psalm 126. Psalm 126. Looking back over my time here when we've been doing this, uh, looking at the kind of the calendar of the year every once in a while to get a glimpse at it nonetheless, I almost always in four Sunday package are going to use one psalm somewhere in the four. There is always a psalm listed somewhere in the uh, lectionary where the scriptures are laid out in sequence and form and are usable by all kinds of people. I don't normally use a lot of what is written in those books. What I do is I uh, find the text for the time and, and try to join in with the churches all around the world that are reading that text. Some of those churches are not believing churches. Some of those churches have a kind of a worship without Jesus. Needs are great. But these scriptures, anointed and fueled by the power of the Holy Spirit, when they come into a mind and a heart, will not leave you the same. There will be differences. And they're good ones. Good differences. God touching a people in such a way that they are never the same again. And that's a cry of our heart for us. All of us are people around us, family members, people that work with us, people that live on our street, people everywhere that we run into at work, the work we do. Opportunity to speak for Jesus. Let me read this psalm. It's only six verses long. And I know that gives you hope for a reasonably short sermon. I realize that. But don't get too attached to that idea. You know, we could just run on down the page after a while. When our Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Notice other nations referring to Israel here. The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We echo in as those who belong to him. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Psalm 126. Psalm 126 is a part of 15 psalms that are right together here at this point in your Bible, the Psalter. They are songs of ascent. Remember that? Psalms of ascent. Festivals took men and sometimes whole families to Jerusalem, celebrate various kinds of victorious things in their life from God. And they made those journeys by requirement, and they traveled long and hard in many cases. And sometimes they sang. And the leading songs for their singing are Psalms 120 all the way to 132 or 134. Those are the Psalms, 134. And they can be sung again and again. And I'm sure they sang them over and over and over as they approached the place of worship and as they finally were there. So we're going to look at this Psalm a little bit and look at what it can say to us. For 10 years, I'm going to give you a little illustration to back up some. For 10 years, the American Southwest as most of us know, experienced devastating drought. Are you aware of that? And the 10 years were leading up to even this 2018 in Arizona and all of that where the problems were great. A devastating drought lasted 10 years. Centuries-old pinyon trees that covered the hills throughout northern New Mexico became susceptible to park beetles, park beetles or bark beetles, and died by the thousands, the beetles, the trees, dead by thousands. Once it was a green landscape, it turned gray, full of dead trees. For long-time residents, it felt like a death in the family. Then one summer, it rained. 
One summer it poured, it rained. It dumped rain on a drought country. Now I can identify with the drought country. When Grace and I moved to uh, Midland, they told us, we have about 13 inches of rain a year. And the first year we were in Midland, they got 36 inches. They thought we were the good omen come to town. I assured them I didn't bring any rain with me, but I sure have enjoyed it. Now the big deal was that when spring came, the spring came, and we drove in through Lano and over to Fredericksburg, and in passing through the hill country, nothing but blue bonnets from the roadside all the way to the top of every hill, nothing but blue bonnet blooms. Wow, how did it happen? Well, they had a little nurture and preparation in the drought because the stuff that died and fell on the ground made a place where you could get some food for your roots, I guess. With whatever plant you were dealing with had life coming up from below, having been cultured and prepared for the spring. It was absolutely amazing. We just kept going back through there every chance we get, trying to see those trees. And in this year it rained and, and everything happened in the Southwest. What came were wildflowers everywhere. You've been in places after a drought and everything is now coming back up and, and it just lit up with color. Lit up with beauty. People couldn't believe their eyes. Every patch of ground was covered, and I like this. I, I didn't find this name. Somebody who wrote about this situation used these words, so I'm going to use them. Every patch of ground was covered with yellow cowpin daisies. Cowpin. Now, you might have not heard that around here, but when you get out in the southwest, I know we saw this in Arizona, even though there were forested trees. These cattlemen would let their cattle run on a lot of big spreads, They'd pay to do it, but they would keep them well through summer and through winter by moving them around some. And when they did that, those old little old uh, lots they built, I called them, these pins around a little lot, it just got beat down. I mean, it was just dirt. It was nothing. And the moats that landed on it from trees that were losing parts of themselves in a drought situation. But they got the, the energy from what was lying on the ground, creating the mulch, creating the stuff that would bring life to the trees around, the life around. Cow pin daisies, along with purple asters and other flowers, all of which had not been seen for 100 years, laying dormant in that dirt so long. Stuff that hadn't grown there, but is growing there now. I think it's an amazing story. I love that story. You know, you'd like that story even if it wasn't true. But it's a true story. Makes it even better. The rain alone was not the reason for the riot of color. The needles of the dead pinions provided mulch nutrients needed by long dormant seeds. And the rain set it going. The trees would never be restored. You, when a tree is dead, a tree is dead. A lot of trees lost. But their death gave birth to new beauty as far as the eye could see. The beauty of restoration, renewal, life, coming because of all of that death. And the life became evident everywhere. Evident all over the place. He who goes out weeping shall come home with shouts of joy. Now that's verse 6. Let me show you. Verse 6, the last verse in 126. Here's how it starts. He who goes out weeping, let me jump a line, shall come home with shouts of joy, period. Now let me give you the whole thing with four lines. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Are they sad who plant in hard places? Yeah, they could be. When the, when the crop is gone, when it doesn't come back, when you don't know where it went. You're sorrowful for the lack of production in life. 
But in this psalm, he who goes out weeping, what, why go out weeping? Because of what has been seen, because of what he hopes for. He's got the seed in his hand now. He's going to go plant it. He's going to put it where it belongs. And he's not sure exactly how it's going to turn out. He's bearing the seed that's going to be sown, and he's going to come home. What's the fruit of that? Well, the first fruit of it is shouts of joy. Now, we could just say that he's going to come home bearing the sheaves. How many of you know that when you plant something, you've got a while to wait for the sheaves? That when you plant a crop of any kind that's going to grow, you've got, to, you've got to wait for it to set and build and get a crop, and it might get blown away again. Who knows? So there's a lot of sadness, a lot of concern about continuing living. So the psalmist said, He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed... Of sowing, for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Ultimately, yes. Bring it on home. I like that picture. I like that picture because it is the life that comes from God that's going to show up to transform a heart that's marked by death. And if you're going to be involved in what God does, we're going to have to recognize that much of the time when God sends us on a sowing mission, we should be weeping for the concern of those for whom and to whom we come. Sowing and reaping. Psalm 126 starts out as out of place a little bit for the third Sunday of Advent. Here's the theme for the third Sunday of Advent. The theme for the third, third Sunday of Advent is joy. Now, wait a minute. Whoa. I know we got a lot of joy talk in this poem, but we got a lot of sadness and crying, weeping, and all of that too. So maybe it's not the best choice. Maybe, maybe it shouldn't be the choice for this wonderful place where we're talking about joy. Now, the first Advent theme is hope. The second Advent theme is peace. Third Advent theme, third, sun, third Sunday in Advent, this one, is joy. And the last one next week is love. Those all are set aside by men to register these days because all these are part of kingdom stuff. All of them are. God doing His work and we receiving our work. But if you look at Psalm 126 and you say not a, it's a little out of place, you've got to realize that joy is a part of it. And they've added a new thing. Grace and I talked about this. How many of you put an Advent candle up in your house? Anybody? Oh, you've got to come to church to even see them burn. That's great. Here we are. And we have three purple candles burning. Get them together, I could only see one. And then there is another one that will be lit next Saturday, next, next Sunday. Be lit for us. What does the white candle represent? It's the Christ. It's the Redeemer. It's the life. All of these Sundays in man's mind as he walks through in worship, all of these Sundays bring us to the revelation of the Messiah, the Redeemer, the one who died for us, the one who came to save us. Now they're using a pink candle in place of one of the purple candles and making the third Sunday, and we're not, we're not changing that right now, making the third Sunday one that recognizes the joy in this uh, redemption that's being worked. Our rose are for Mary, the rose in winter. And the liturgical churches will acknowledge that Mary is the rose in winter that rises in redemption. Maybe she just was there for Jesus as his mama. I don't know. We've, we've talked about Mary before, but I never put her anywhere near the redemption plan because there's only one Savior and one Lord. Mary does not save us. You may be a part of a Catholic church and you may think that Mary is going to do something better than Jesus can. He will not do that because we step over into the work of Jesus and try to have Mary... Fit the bill. No matter how much we do with that, we can't do it. We cannot make it work that way. 
So they make room for Mary in liturgical churches of all kinds, from Presbyterians to others listed in, you know, English church, Church of England, all those use it. But the poem, the psalm, speaks of joy, even shouts of joy. Shouts of joy. With images of seeds and sowing and sheaves, all those are mentioned in this psalm. Things that have to do with harvest. Getting the seeds down, preparing for the crop coming in. All of it has to do with harvest. It seems better suited than this psalm does for Thanksgiving than it does Advent. And the Advent song is a song of ascents used by pilgrims going to Jerusalem, as I said. It's more in common with this song for singing, Come, you thankful people. Wouldn't that work better? Come, you thankful people. But what we sing instead is, Come, thou long-expected Jesus. Got great words, good words. My greatest experience with Come, thou long-expected Jesus was when the uh, pastors in town and, and the council had meetings once a month and met in our church. We furnished a free meal. Not everybody did that. Folks wanted to be where the meal was free. And Grace and some other ladies cooked that meal every month. And we served it to them, and it was pretty good. I'd, you know, we had, we had this going on in Midland, too, for a while. And the lady we had doing it there, she just loved that turkey ham. We tried our best to tell her that these pastors don't want to eat fake ham. They don't want to eat turkey made into ham. They want to eat ham ham. Oh, no, this is great and it's cheap as dirt. Yeah. Cheap. We finally got it changed. They liked that a lot better. And then we, and then she brought it back just to make sure we didn't get our way very far. Come now, long expected Jesus. I had, at, sitting at table, I was making my round of the table. I was president of the Alliance at that time. I was shaking hands with people, getting ready to start meeting. And right beside the Lutheran from the Tree of Life Lutheran Church uh, here, who was pastoring here then, was sitting right beside the Monsignor. Yeah, the Monsignor came to the Alliance meeting. He just liked me and I liked him, so I invited him. He kept coming. And they're sitting there and we get a start on a song. Come, thou long and it's the Lutheran. Now listen, you understand the Lutheran Catholic situation, don't you? Martin Luther would explain it to you if he were here. And the Monsignor would look to hide somewhere until he left. That's how it would be. But they started singing, and then the Monsignor had a great voice. Takes off in harmony. And in perfect harmony, those two sang all those verses. And I just... I just said, wow, thank you, Jesus, for being. You showed that we could live together for at least an hour and not kill each other. I like that plan. It was good. It said something about what was going on. Now, I heard a lot of things about a lot of people when I came to town, but I'm telling you, that event, no matter how long it took to get it going, that event was worth being a part of because we talked about then what this meant, this separation and division. And uh, the Lord is able to restore anything He wants to restore. But He's not going to throw truth away. He's not going to reject what He's already revealed in Scripture to be true in order to make you acceptable to it. Do we understand that? That He's not going to make it possible for us to receive it by making it not something it should be, something it ought not be. See, in some of our, in some of our churches, we don't want to talk about Anything that brings a little bit of a shake-up to a situation. Why not? A shake-up's all over the country right now. Everything's shaken. Been shaken, going to be shaken, not through shaken. Just well speak the truth and start it right in the local church where we have the opportunity to speak and get away with it. And then take it to wherever we live, whatever we do. 
until we're saying this is the truth of the gospel. It's in Jesus Christ alone. It's in He who came to die for me, a sinner. It is He who was raised from the dead that I might be raised from the dead and restored to life and wholeness. Closer reading reveals the Advent messengers okay. Like what? Hey, watcher, tell us of the night. You watch the night and make sure if anything comes in that's alien to truth, you can point it out. Tell us. Watcher, what of the night? The psalm looks for signs of God's promise in dark and difficult times. Because God's made some promises, and no matter how dark the times get, His promise remains. No matter how impossible it seems that God could hold this position and make it work, He will. He will not give up the truth that He establishes or declares. He'll change us. He first finds those that are in remembrance of things past. We remember past things when we come to weeks like this, don't we? Did you have some good Christmases when you were a kid, or were they all bad? Did you have some good times with family? A lot of things change from those first Christmases, don't they? Things that we never wanted to change, things that we are sorry changed, all of that in us, human beings. But in the joy and the laughter, the people knew God had brought them home from exile. They knew they were home from exile. Their mouth was full of laughter. They knew what God had done. Even their neighbors acknowledged their deeds and what God had done for them. And then they could sing it back. God has done great things for us. I can lift my hand and tell you, God has done great things for me. God has done great things for you. And there's hands up way back there in the sound booth. You don't have to turn it any time right now. Just hold your hand up. It's good. God has done great things. He really has. Don't let the enemy come in and trip you up on that and try to get you looking at the bad things. My father never became a Christian visibly. That is, he never, I never was there to pray with him where he actually acknowledged Jesus. I did pray with him, but I didn't hear him acknowledge Jesus. He was 65 years old. He was on his deathbed. Cancer had worked its skills all in him. My dad was a German, almost as hard-headed as a couple other Germans I knew. I mean, the neighborhood was full of these hard-headed Germans where I grew up. They were all German names, from Borkstead to whatever. Lots of Germans. And I thought, my dad is hard, kind of difficult, and I never wanted him to know I'd done something wrong because I knew he had a belt on. That's what he took off to run me down with. That hurt. Little kid about 10 years old, I got baby siblings following around. We went to church on New Year's Eve and we had our Christmas party like we always did. We kids had a great time, got a bag of good stuff to eat and enjoy. And on the way home, we were just looking for Santa Claus. Listen, I, I let Santa Claus be real for a long time. Anybody let Santa Claus be real a long time? It, there you go. We had a good time with it, didn't we? And then when I found out who it was and what they were doing, I was up in the attic every time looking at what they got me, which ruined it. It did. When I got home that night from church, we were turning over the court, over the, uh, what did I have there? Yeah. Cow guard, cattle guard. We had cattle guards quite a few places. Had an oil patch that my dad worked in out there and they had cattle guards as they went in and out of all those places. They didn't have to use the lock all the time. But we looked and around the corner we went and I saw them. Perfect, 
perfect little places, flat on the ground, that sand and that dirt on the corner where Santa's sleigh had gone right down the road. Santa's sleigh had gone right across the cattle yard into the sandy lane. It led right to our house. And then there was more coming back out, and I just knew Santa Claus has come. That jolly, marvelous deliverer has brought the goods. My dad got smarter, too. He started taking all the stuff we were going to get, which wasn't very much, but it was nice stuff. He took it to Grandma's house across the field. I never could find it like that. It was messed up. But I was so delirious. I told a friend of mine, he thought I was nuts. What's wrong with you? Your parents are Santa Claus. That's boring, isn't it? I couldn't be talked out of it for quite a while. It was him doing something, though, out of character totally out of character and it's the thing I've always remembered about that I remember what happened I remember how it went and I remember his attitude in it the smile on his face the time he's involved that time and I'm still blessed because I can think back to it and sometimes I want to stop and say Lord Jesus would you just kind of show us the track where you've been through here and lead us right on in to where we need to Pray for this sick person or do that. Just lead us right into this place, you know, so we can see your work and your life working. When we often look back at Christmas past, we recall joys and various things that are just significant in our thinking. So continue, continue to do that. Recall those better times, so to speak. Like the psalmist, we can remember when our mouths were filled with laughter. We can remember when our family was all together. We can remember when our church was full. People were eager to be a part of it. We can remember our nation when it was at peace and a little simpler than it is today. And the world seems, if not joyous, we can see it's at least a safer place. Maybe back there when it was simpler, I don't know. Maybe here when we're not sure. Psalm 126 is not an exercise in nostalgia. We're not just going to read it and think back and consider some things. Remembering things past has a present purpose. Present purpose. Recalling God's deliverance long ago leads directly to the call for God to use that same kind of transforming power now. He hasn't changed. He's the same. We even ask God in this psalm to demonstrate greater power than before. Look at verse 4. Restore our fortunes, O Lord. Well, they already said he'd restored them up front, so that's what God is doing. And God could look back at any time when he restored fortunes, when he blessed his people, when they were having trouble, when they were out of trouble, when they finally got to where they thought they should be, when they moved them somewhere else along the land they had been given. But in verse 4, restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. And went on to say, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. There's the tears and the joy. Even ask God to demonstrate greater power than before. There's some folk around, you know, you look at this, they're not content with Isaiah's vision of streams in the desert. They want water courses. They want huge water supplies in the Negev which is the south land where it's dry and parched and not much place to have water run listen to this this people reading Psalm 126 they want as the New Revised Standard Version so translated they want water courses rivers or torrents of water in the Negev, in the desert, 
in the parched part of their country. A desert whose name means dry, parched. It's the hottest place around. Right there. When Isaiah predicted that sorrow and sighing shall flee away, and he does it in Isaiah 35, Isaiah 51, and in both of them, the word is exactly the same. Every word, exactly the same. 126 proclaims that sadness will be transformed into shouts of joy. You see it? Transformed into shouts of joy. The psalmist's word for joy incorporates two other words to get the full picture, abundance and power. When it came to God's people, they not only got joy, they got an abundant joyful life. They got a victorious joyful life. They were full because of His power and His fullness. You think God will let you go out here when you're struggling to walk with Him? Or will He stay there? Will He come? Will He be there? Will He keep returning until there He is, changing you? This joy is not just masas. Now, that's a little word I don't know how to pronounce. So let's say rejoicing. Or simka, which means gladness or mirth, are the third word all used in this very same section of Scripture, the word rina, which is there is a loud cry, proclamation of joy, a shout of victory, all tied to this one particular word that identifies the joy that comes. Shouts of joy. Joy everywhere. Proclamation of joy, a shout of victory. Moreover, the rina, that's a word from uh, the Hebrew. The rina echoes three times, 2, 5, and 6. Here's how it's translated. Verse 2. Our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongues with shouts of joy. Rina. A proclamation of joy. Shout of joy. All there in one word. Verse 5. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. Rina. And verse 6 shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with them. Three times that same Hebrew word is used in this six verse thing. And you know that there are so many things that are less than what that promise is. There is just the, the kind of the happiness of it and the laughter of it and uh, all of that. But then when you begin to look at it from verse two to verse five to verse six, there is the word that means more than any other joy. Here it is. Joy in its fullness. Underscoring that, that ultimate joy that comes when we're sowing with tears running down our face with the confidence that there will come joy. God will bring it. In promising such joy, the psalm offers an important pastoral insight into its nature and this is just a little thing this is no jingle bells joy it is not jingle bells joy where the psalmist offers an important pastoral insight into its nature when he does that it's just going to be a little different no single bells joy no jingle bells joy just the swipe of a credit card could do that Hope it's good, but, you know, swipe of a credit card. The seeds of this joy have been planted in sadness. The latter part of this verse is full of that, this, this psalm. And watered with tears. Planted with sadness, watered with tears. Is that too hard to think about? This is the honest joy. The joy we don't like to think about having. The thing we don't like to consider. A joy that often comes only after weeping has tarried for the night. Joy comes in the morning. It's the weeping 
in the midst of the journey with Jesus that gets us to the morning as he works in us and keeps us and guides us. Such an understanding of joy is vital in the life of faith. You believe when there is no joy because your belief is in God and Jesus and he who has redeemed you and made you his. And I also have to remember that all these celebrations we talk about like what we're doing here, that the weeks leading up to Christmas can be a real time of sorrow. It may not be quite so happy clappy. Why? Because you may be considering a spouse who left you by God's design just weeks ago. And we want you to come in and join us and shout with joy everything. Maybe not. Maybe it's better to kneel at the feet of Jesus and say, Lord, I don't know how to do this. You know that. But by your grace, I will live this. I will do this. I will walk through this. For all these celebrations, the week can be tough. Sometimes the experience of Advent puts us in a trap as a personal sadness because of the things that have been lost or the people that have been. Sorrow can separate us from God, particularly if we confess or confuse Advent's true joy with our culture's teaching about happiness and stuff. You get lost in it. Psalm 126 acknowledges the reality of sorrow and also remembers and points to God's power to transform sorrow into joy. Know that. This, this joy that the psalm remembers and anticipates is a particular kind of joy, and I have to get that to you as well. It is a joy of the harvest. See, now we find out that this very psalm can be identified with the harvest and is the joy of the harvest. That could reinforce the argument that the psalm is better for bringing in the sheaves than preparing for the birth of the Messiah. Where it will for the fact that for the Hebrews, harvest joy is celebrated far more than good crops. It had to do with the blessing of God. It had to do with the peace of God. It had to do with the present working of God. And when the people of Israel brought their first fruits to the temple, they not only thanked God for the abundance of that particular year, but they also gave thanks for God's deliverances in the past, pulling it all together. There's a ritual commanded in Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 1 through 11, and this we pick up as we live for Jesus or for God in this new land he gave them. Moving them into the land, he had them bring the first fruits of their crop. Stand before God and make sure things were done rightly. So this is commanded in Deuteronomy 26, the first 11 verses. They remembered God's thankfulness and transform, transforming power that went all the way back to Abraham. Assignment. Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 11. And you'll see what God did in allowing and putting together that action. I won't take time to read it. It takes a little while. So you, you are assigned to read it, okay? Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 11. Their harvest prayer always recalled how God's power had transformed them from Pharaoh's slaves to sowers of their own seed. A free people in a promised land. The natural power of God to turn seeds into grain, that's miracle enough. But Psalm 126 makes an even greater statement. The seeds are not ordinary seeds. Seeds coming out of sorrow. So that the one who is sorrowful marches with that seed. The fruit they bear is not given is not grain or wheat, it's shouts of joy. Fruit bearers, before they ever have a crop or a bundle of sheaves in their hand. Instead, the image, sow in sorrow, reap in joy, incorporated an ancient Near East belief 
that keeping while or weeping while you planted made the crops more productive. You'll have to think about that one, I know. I'm still thinking on it. I'll be working on it for a while. One more page. Can you say amen to that? Good. This will finish us. By linking um, that understanding that I just said to the celebration of God's deliverance, the psalm changes an agricultural practice into a powerful theological statement dealing with God, always with God. It affirms God's power, and it affirms the people's faith. You get God's power and the people of Israel together on the same track, where God wants them. Believing and acting on that which identifies with this God, you're going to see the miracle that God always promised them. Not just recovery, but a full established transformation of their lives in himself. The psalm not only calls upon God to use that transforming power, but also calls us to be open to its possibility. It challenges us to trust God's joy. You ever said that? I just kind of popped out when I was doing some thinking on it. It challenges us to trust. What do you mean trust God's joy? And we're going to, where will we find God, first of all, to, to be able to find out if he's joyous today? Oh, come on. Does he have joy just sometimes? Or is our God able to love whom he chooses when he will? So whatever we encounter, we trust God's joy stable in Bethlehem. Wait a minute, Pastor, that's, that's a hard place, a young woman having a child, hard place, and got all this celebration to do, and it's hard on everybody, that, all of that. Just look. Just look. And you see the baby in the manger, Bethlehem. Look. There's what was promised. Look. There he is. You think the shepherds who came along with that got excited? I don't know what their age was. You know, they might have been old enough not to get too excited, afraid they'd break something. But, you know, maybe not. Some of us don't jump and run anymore. We know full well if we miss, we're going to be in trouble. We're going to break something. I don't want to do that. We encounter it in a stable in Bethlehem. God's joy. We did encounter it in an empty tomb, God's joy. And we can encounter it in acres of cowpin daisies and purple asters. And know that God on the throne is joyous again. God filled with joy at the lot gate. Wow. Thank God for blue bonnets all the way to the top of the hill. Thank God for babies who are healthy and blessed. Thank God for dads who take their place with their children and their spouses. Because in every one of these cases, you'll find the joy of God when you find the biblical reality of obedience and blessing. Let's pray. Father, you're so marvelously rich in joy, rich in blessing, rich in love. We're so thankful to be your children. We're so thankful to wake up every morning and know that we are not alone and never will be. We're thankful that we can lie down at night and the peace of God watches over our minds and our hearts. We're thankful that we can travel busy roads and highways and places and stay busy doing this, that, and the other, and you keep us and open doors to us and bless us in the going. All we can say is thank you, Father. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you for the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, using us to the majesty and glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen.